My name is Terry Covey, and I'm the pastor of Twin Oaks Baptist Church. This message that you are about to hear was delivered at Twin Oaks. We pray that it will be a blessing to you, and if there are any questions that you may have or any way that we may be of help to you, please feel free to contact us. God bless you, and have a great day. So won't you be taking your Bibles and turning to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. The other day I was reading a book, and a guy gave a little illustration in it and uh, he said this is a silly little illustration but man it, it stuck with me I thought it really helps to say a lot of what I'm wanting to say today in the message the guy asked his wife one day he said have you ever uh, wondered what goes through a caterpillar's mind and she's like what and she said well what would make you ask a question like that what goes through a caterpillar's mind he said, well, you think about it. He says, a caterpillar is born. And he said, a caterpillar has to crawl around on the ground for most of its life. And then it kind of just gets sleepy. And it goes to sleep. And then it wakes up. And it's got wings. And it can fly. He says, you know, it probably freaks it out. You know, I thought, you know, that is true. You know, you think about it, the, the transformation that happens in this little bug that's, that's a worm that's crawling around like a worm in the dirt, and then the next thing it knows, it's, it's, it's awake, and it has these beautiful wings. It's probably one of the prettiest things that God has ever made, a butterfly. You ever wondered what actually went through the mind of the disciples of Jesus Christ as they were following him, and then Christ was crucified, and then they saw him go back to his father, and they were left with the responsibility of, of carrying on his ministry, his mission, but, you know, they started out, I think, at times they thought, yeah, we can handle this. We can do it. But then the further along they went, the more they realized that they could not do it. Matter of fact, at the time when they really should have risen to the occasion, they failed miserably. Not only did Peter deny that he even knew the Lord, but the Bible says the rest of the disciples fled as well. They all failed God. They all realized that they were worms, if I could put it in that way, they were kind of like worms crawling on the ground. But then God, if you read it in the book of Acts, if you read it in the early chapters of the book of Acts, it's, it's amazing the transformation that happened in just a few days for these men. They went from, from men who, who were so weak and fearful and doubtful and, and self-centered, really selfish, self-centered men. They, went, they, tra they were transformed from being that to men who were full of faith, courageous, willing to look at authority square in the eye and say, no, this is the truth. We will not back down. To be willing, and they did. They gave their lives for it. And not only that, but they were self-denying. They went from being self-seeking men to self-denying men in just a matter of days. So what in the world caused such a transformation for these men? Well, I think the same thing can happen to, for us as well. And in verse 49, Luke 24, verse 49, Jesus said unto them, and this is before Christ has ascended back to the Father, and this is before they've actually experienced the transformation. But Jesus said in verse 49, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry or wait ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So what's that, what is Jesus saying to them? Jesus is saying that God has been promising you something, and really the promise that God has been given, you go all the way back in the Old Testament. You go back into the book of Ezekiel. You go into the book of Joel and all of these other prophecies, and you find that God was making this promise to the nation of Israel and to us as well. God was going to do something very special for us, and a part of God's promise was that God was going to send to us His supernatural power so that our lives could be changed from worms into like butterflies, if you will. So our lives could be changed from something that's just crawling around on the ground, wasting our life by crawling around on the ground, to something that is able to, to not only live and prosper, to, but to bring glory to God. And that's exactly what happened with the disciples. I mean, they were just common, most of those were just common, ordinary fishermen, uneducated, illiterate, not theologically trained, anything like that. 
ill-equipped, the last man that you would ever choose, probably, if you were going to, to establish a company, a business, you know, this is probably, some of these were the last, I mean, Matthew is a crook, you know, and the other guys are just illiterate kind of men. These are some of the last men you would have ever chosen. But Christ chose them, not because of who they were, but because of who God wanted to make them to be. God could see into their lives, and God could realize, with my power in you, here's who you can be. My power going from you, I can totally transform your life. And Jesus said, you're going to receive what God has been promising. You're to wait in the city of Jerusalem until you, the word endued literally means to be clothed with this power. And this, the Greek word for power there is dunamis, from which we get the English word dynamite. <laughs> You'll be clothed with this dynamic power that is going to be sent from on higher, from God himself. God is going to send them this very special power. Now, let me say to you, first of all, in the message, we do not have to wait for this power. We do not have to pray for this power. Probably we're all guilty of praying that God would send his spirit. And that's an incorrect, that is a non-biblical prayer. We should not be praying that. We should not be praying, please, dear God, send your spirit. You know why we should not be praying that? Because God has already done it. God sent his spirit to the church on the day of Pentecost. So we're not having to beg God to send his spirit. God is saying, I'm just waiting on you. I'm waiting on you to get in touch with it. I'm waiting on you to yield yourself to what is already there available. God is already, if you are a born again believer today, God has already put his supernatural power in you. Are you experiencing it? Probably not. Why is that? Well, we're going to study more about it in the weeks ahead, but I'll tell you why it is. It's because you and I get in the way. Our biggest problem is ourself. We get in the way of this power. We, we'll study it more in, in, in greater detail in other messages, but we, what the Bible says, we, we grieve the Holy Spirit, we bring sorrow to the Holy Spirit by our actions, by our choices, by our attitudes, we grieve the Holy Spirit, and the Bible also says we can quench, we can suppress the Holy Spirit. It's like the power is there, but we hold it back. We push it out of the way. We get in front of it so that the power cannot live and flow and work through us. Let's talk about the promise of the Holy Spirit. This is God's dynamic spiritual power. It is God himself. That's what the power is. The power is not something God gives to us. The power is God himself. God the Spirit himself living in us. So how much is God able to do through us? How much can you do if you're yielded to the Spirit? You are able to do anything God chooses to do. Think about that. If you are a born-again believer and you truly have the Holy Spirit living within you, you can do anything that God chooses to do. If you and I will just learn how to yield ourselves to that power and let God flow through us and in us, work in us and flow through us to use us for his glory. The power is the, what the Bible calls the Holy Spirit of God. Now, sometimes in the King James Version of the Bible, he's translated as Holy Ghost and sometimes as Holy Power. Some say that the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit are different, and that's not, that's not true. The same word that is translated as Spirit is translated as Ghost. Pneumos, from which we get pneumatic, air, wind, breath, that's what the word means. The Holy Spirit, speaking, biblically speaking, in the Greek language, the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost are the same person. Why the King James translators used the word ghost, sometimes only they know. I have no idea why they did that. I'm sure they had a great logical reason for that at that time, but there's not a difference in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Spirit. Who or what is he? Well, let me say this to you. He's a who and not a what. He's as much a personal being as God the Father and God the Son. We pray to God the Father. We can envision God in our minds, although we've never seen God. We can envision God in our minds. And so we realize that God loves. We realize that God cares. We realize that God can even be saddened, all of these kind of things, or God can be joyful. 
God is the father there in the prodigal son who was rejoicing when his son came back home. And so God the father experiences emotions. We know Jesus experienced emotions while he was here on earth. Jesus wept. He cried even at times. And the Holy Spirit is as much a personal being as God the Father and God the Son. He's a part of the Trinity. You say, explain the Trinity. I can't. No one else can. It's God. It's beyond my little mind. I'm, you know, beyond what I can even try to explain to you. But the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit thinks. He has a will. He has feelings. He expresses emotions. And that's who he is, this personal God being that is in us. Now, the next question. Why do we need the Holy Spirit even today in our lives? Do we need the Holy Spirit? I guess is the first question that we should ask ourselves. I remember many years ago hearing Vernon McGee saying a message that the Holy Spirit could not show up in the average church on Sunday morning and no one would know it. Why? Because we know what to do. We know what to sing. We know how to give. We know how to pray. We've got, our, we've got our services so organized. We've been doing it for so long. We can do it with our eyes closed. And so probably many churches are guilty of going through a Sunday morning service. And out of their own religious power and ability. Rather than relying upon the Holy Spirit to actually move. But I believe that we do need the Holy Spirit. Every one of us needs the Holy Spirit as being active in our life today. And you say, why do we need that? Well, let me, let me explain to you a little bit here. The Bible says, if you go all the way back in the book of Genesis, you'll find that when God created us as men and women, God created us with three parts to our being. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Now, we know what the body is. We recognize the body. We deal with it every day. But the Bible also teaches us that we have a soul. What is the soul? The Greek word for soul, we get from the Greek word soul, we get the English word psyche, psychology. What is, what is that? What is the psyche? The psyche is the center of our emotions, our feelings, our behavior. You know, it's like uh, if, if, if I would say to Tammy, Tammy, I love you with all of my heart. Does that mean that I love her with this organ that is in me? And that if I had a heart transplant, I would no longer love her, but suddenly I start loving the woman that I got the heart from the guy. Is that what it means? No. We understand that there's something more to us than just this physical body. We understand that there's a part. Matter of fact, this is one thing that, that the evolutionists cannot explain. They struggle with this. Why do we have a conscience? Why do we have a sense of right and wrong? Why is there this some inner deeper part of us that cannot be tested necessarily? What is love? You know, the old question, what is love? You can't, you can't, do, you can't take it into a laboratory, right? And come out with the, and know what love is. It's something beyond. So it means there's a part of our being that is beyond the physical part of us. And the Bible calls it the soul. The common word today, psyche. They're the same word. It means the soul. What is the soul? The soul is the center of our emotions, our behavior, our will. It's the real you, if you will. God created us with a body. God created us with a soul. But then God created a third part of our being, and we could call it the spiritual part of our being. God created us to be spiritual people. Why did God create us to be spiritual people? Because the Bible says that God himself is a spirit, and therefore those who worship or who know him must do so in spirit and in truth. In order to know God, in order to experience God, in order to, to talk with God and feel God talk with you, in order to have a relationship with God, you have to do it in a spiritual kind of way. I've never seen God. He doesn't come and sit down beside of me. And I don't have a physical conversation with somebody that I'm looking at. But yet I have, I've had several conversations with him already today. How do I do that? I communicate through this spiritual part of my being. I have a body. I have a soul, a psyche. And then I have a spiritual part of my being. God created Adam and Eve to be this three-part being. And in the very beginning, they were going through life, and everything was great for them because they were talking, they were communicating with God. Matter of fact, it says in the book of Genesis that God came walking in the cool of the day. The Hebrew word for cool means with uh, wind or breath or spirit. So perhaps, I don't know, perhaps the spirit of God was flowing through the gentle breeze of the day. What kind of fellowship they had with God. 
and they were they they God didn't come walking like you know the spirit of God was working through waking going through the garden and they were having this conversation with God a spiritual conversation with God and everything was great until they disobeyed God and we call that sin after Adam and Eve had sinned against God what kind of relationship did they have with God did they run out there to talk with God and, and say oh God you're so great We've been. what did they do they went and hid themselves from God why do people want to stiff arm God? Why are people afraid of the church and the Bible and God and Jesus and all of this kind of stuff? Because God told Adam and Eve, he says, the day that you disobey me or sin against me, you will die. That means a physical death, but it also means a spiritual death. And the moment that Adam and Eve disobeyed God, the spiritual part of them, they experienced death in that, so therefore they were unable to communicate with God. Uh, back when we used to use the landline so much, you know, landline telephones and you always had to cord. I used to use this illustration when I was talking with people. And I would say to them, you know, I could take this phone today and I would unhook the cord out of the receiver there and I'd say, you know, listen, I'll tell you something. If you call 540-639-2196, there will be a man there by the name of Melvin and his wife is Jean. Call him. Can you hear anything? They're like, well, no. But I said, does that mean because you can't hear them, does that mean that they don't exist? No, I said, that just means you lack the ability to communicate. There's a break in the connection between you and them. But when that connection is restored between you and them, then you could call them and you could talk with them. When Adam and Eve sinned against God, the sin caused a break. And there was a break in that fellowship. There was a break in that relationship between man and God. Until God did something to reconnect us. Jesus told a man, a very religious man one night, he said, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be born again? Literally, that phrase means born from above. God has to produce a new spiritual birth within us. What happens? God sent his Holy Spirit here to this earth the Holy Spirit is here whether people understand it, recognize it or not. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's everywhere present. He's God. And He's here upon this earth. And the Holy Spirit, as He goes about through this earth, the Holy Spirit, because God created each of us, and because God loves us, and because it breaks the heart of God that there's, a, that, that there's this broken relationship between a man and God or between a woman and God, God wants to restore that relationship. So God sends His Spirit, and God begins to speak to that individual. What does God say to that individual? Well, one of the things God says to them is that you're sinful. I'm holy, but you're sinful. So therefore, we can't, we can't have a relationship. The Bible says God is light. He doesn't fellowship with darkness. But God, the Spirit says something to us. God says, you are sinful, but, but I love you so much that I have done something in order for this relationship to be restored between us. I sent my son here. You celebrate a season called Christmas. What is Christmas about? You remember a manger and a baby and all of that kind of stuff? God sent his son here to this earth, and his son was born as a human so that he could grow up and as a human die for the sins of humanity, die for the sins of my, my sins, your sins. God sent his son to do that on a cross. And the Spirit says, when you recognize this, when you recognize that you are sinful and that you have no hope of knowing God, but you will realize that I love you. I love you enough that I was willing to give my life for you. I took the penalty of all your sins. And if you will but just bow your will before me and then say, Oh God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Oh God, forgive me. I'm, I'm more worthy. I'm the worm. The biblical word for it is repentance. If you will but do that, the Spirit says, then God will restore. God will forgive you of all of your sins. He'll wipe the slate clean because Jesus poured the penalty. And not only that, the Spirit, the Bible teaches us, I will come and live inside of you. When I come and live inside of you, you will be a new creation. 
I will change you from the worm into the butterfly. I will raise you above the dirt of this earth. I'll cause you to soar on eagle's wings if that's where you want to go. I'll take you as high as you want to go. You will experience God. And that's what you want. That's how far I will take you, the Spirit says. And when we choose by faith to believe that and to accept that, we are born again and the Spirit of God comes to work within us and then we start this process of growth in our lives. Look at John chapter 7. Let me share with you just, just how much God wants to do in our lives today as a believer. John chapter 7. Jesus one day, he was standing there and he was watching them go through this religious rigmarole, <laughs> ritual. And it just so frustrated Jesus because he thought, all you're doing is going through motion, religion, but you don't understand. And in verse 37, it says, In that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, if anyone is thirsty for God, truly thirsty for God, Jesus said, Let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Jesus was watching them perform this ceremony, part of the ceremony. They would go with this golden picture and they would go to the pool of Siloam and they would dip out water and they would come back and they would pour out this water before God and they would quote Isaiah which says, with joy let us draw from the water from the wells of salvation. And they were going through that motion every day. And Jesus thought, you are going through the motions but you have no idea what it means. Jesus was saying it's more than just pouring out physical water on the ground. That physical water is only a symbol of the water that God wants to give you to satisfy what you're searching for. Some of you are trying sex. Some of you are trying alcohol. Some of you are trying drugs. Some of you are trying greed. Some of you are trying all kinds of things to satisfy something inside of you. And Jesus, the Bible says Jesus cried out passionately he cried out and he said, if anyone who's really thirsty for God, Jesus said, I will give you water that will gush out of you. It will flow out of you. Notice what it says in verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus had not yet died on the cross. Jesus had not yet ascended back to the Father. So the Holy Spirit had not yet come. But Jesus is saying, listen, there is something here for you if you just understand and really, if you're really thirsty for it. Listen, church, here's the question. Are we thirsty for it? church won't be thirsty for it unless I'm thirsty for it unless you're thirsty for it you know we sometimes pray for revival where's revival going to come revival's going to come from us we're not going to step into it one day there can't be revival if we are willfully resisting God it's foolish to pray for revival if we are not thirsty for it but Jesus is saying, if you are thirsty as an individual, if you're really thirsty for God, then God will cause rivers of living water to gush out, not only in you, but out of you. Out of you. You read about the great revivals that happened both in Europe and America, and I'll tell you how you'll find that these revivals began. It began with a handful of people who were truly thirsty for it, and they were so thirsty for it that they were willing to pray for it passionately every day, sometimes for weeks and months and years, but they would not let go. I remember one time hearing about the great Welsh revival back in the 1800s, and God moved in such a way that thousands of people were being saved. 
And I remember hearing, they were reading the testimony of this one girl. And this one girl said that she was kind of scared of God. And she didn't know what to believe. She was a teenager. And yet one night she was drawn to this home prayer meeting. And she went to this home prayer meeting. And she said when she stepped into that room, there was such a presence of God in that room. That she said, she said I was just immediately humbled and fell on my knees. That's the mighty rushing river that God has for us. Jesus says, I want to give you this water of life, and I want it to, to flow, not only in you, but out of you. The presence of God in our life. God wants us to experience his presence in a most unbelievable kind of way. I've got all kinds of books on the Holy Spirit, and I've been reading and studying those books and trying to gather my thoughts for this part of the series, getting fit, getting fully in touch with God. And I noticed that the, the titles of some of these books caught my attention. Adrian Rogers' book is called The Power of His Presence. The Power of God's Presence. David Jeremiah wrote a book called God in You writing about the Holy Spirit. But the book that really caught my attention was a book by a guy by the name of Francis Chan. You know what the title of his book is on the Holy Spirit? Forgotten God. Forgotten God. In other words, in most of the conservative Bible preaching, teaching churches, we have forgotten the Holy Spirit. We have forgotten the need for the Holy Spirit. You see, God the Father planned our salvation. God the Son purchased our salvation. But it is God the Spirit that produces. He gives us the new life. And He creates this life. And causes this life to, to flourish. When Jesus, I believe, was speaking about. We studied last week. You abide in me and my words abide in you. Abiding in Christ, I believe, is through the relationship of the Holy Spirit. As we abide in Christ and Christ abides in us. Then, then the life of God himself flows into our spirit. Like life that flows out of a branch, in, out of a vine into a branch. And it causes then that branch to produce fruit. God wants to cause his spirit. Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. Religion, Christianity, without the Holy Spirit is, is religion. It's useless. It's formalism. I don't care if you use choir robes or you don't use choir robes. I don't care if you sing hymns or praise courses. I don't care if you lift your hands or you don't lift your hands. Anything that we do that is not empowered by the Holy Spirit is of us. And it's wood, hay, and stubble. And it's just religion. That means nothing. But what God wants is for me as an individual, and you as an individual, to be so thirsty for God that we are seeking to draw from that well of water every moment of every day. Not just drinking that water once a week. Not just drinking that water once a day. But drinking that water constantly. The other day I was uh, in a conversation. And, and the conversation wasn't necessarily going the way that I wanted the conversation to go. And, and me, I wanted to say, well, I'll tell you what the problem is. And I felt like the Spirit said to me, you just need to be quiet and you just need to pray for him. Let me speak to him. And so I did that. I didn't even answer back. I didn't even, I just, this individual's kind of talking and I'm walking along and I'm like, dear Lord, I know this individual. I know that they're, I know they're a Christian. So I'm sitting there thinking, Lord, I know they're a Christian. I know your spirit is in them. So Lord, please help them to understand that this attitude is wrong. Please help them to see. Did he? I don't know. He does me. Man, I do something wrong, and immediately the Holy Spirit says, that is wrong. No one else even has to tell me, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? That is wrong. That is God. And see, you and I have to learn how to listen to that and, and seek to hear that whisper. That voice.
voice of God in the cool of the day, that gentle breeze, to hear it whispering to us so that we walk in harmony with it. So when he says go, we go. And when he says no, we know. We do whatever it is he wants us to do. What's that song about? Lord, I give you my heart. I give. What's that song about we sang just a few moments ago? It's more than just a song. It's about God, I am going to get over myself so that you can live in and through me and be glorified for the reason you made me. That's what that song is about. And until we do that, we are not being the body of Christ. We're just religion. We're no better than the Pope. We're just religion, right? Is the Spirit saying yes to this? The Spirit is saying yes to this. Oh, brethren, though, the power. Look at John chapter 14. I need to take you through some verses quickly here. I believe there's so much the Holy Spirit is wanting to say to me and to you. And in verse 16 of chapter 14, Jesus said, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another, King James says, another comforter that he may abide with you forever. What does the word comforter mean? Well, the word comforter means more than just to console us in a time of sorrow, which the Holy Spirit does that. But literally, the word right there, some of your transla translations may say helper, which really is a better translation. I will give you a helper. You say, I can't do it. You're right, you can't. But you can do all things through Christ who will give you the strength. You can do all things that God wants you to do through the power of His Helper who abides in you. He can give you the strength to be a godly husband or a godly wife or a godly mom or a godly dad or a godly son or a godly daughter or a godly student or a godly worker or a godly employer. He can give you the power to be a godly person in whatever it is God has called you to do by His Helper. The Holy Spirit of God who lives within you. Look at uh, chapter 16, verse 7. Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient, and the word means advantageous. It is advantageous. It is better for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the helper will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, I'm sure the disciples thought, what are you talking about, that it's better that you would go away than stay? Do you think it would be good if Jesus would come to church here every Sunday? Would you like to sit and listen to Jesus do the preaching and teaching? Absolutely. But Jesus said, it is more advantageous for me to go back to the Father. Why? Because Jesus said, until I have finished my part, my part is to purchase the salvation. Until I finish my part, he cannot produce his part, the Holy Spirit. But he says, when I have finished my part and I'm back at the Father, I will send the Spirit and he will come. And the word another means of the same kind. He, God himself, in the form of the Spirit, will come and he will abide with you forever. And Jesus said, you will not only do what I do. Jesus says, you will do greater works. Greater works. Greater not in quality but greater in quantity. You see, when Jesus decided to come and take upon human flesh, Jesus could only be at one place at one time. He's either in Nazareth, or He's in Galilee, or He's in Jerusalem. He's limited by the human body. But the Holy Spirit, because He's in spirit form, He is not limited. So that means that the Holy Spirit can be in believers in Brooklyn, New York, and Beijing, China at the same time. It means that if the whole church would yield itself to God around the world, God would be magnified through the whole church at the same time. What glory that would be. Jesus said you're going to be clothed with this power from on high. What is this power that God wants to give to us? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Some people would say, well, this power, and some denominations would teach that this power that God will give to us is speaking in tongues. 
Some would say, no, it's, it's healing. It's vision. It's, it's all of these miraculous kind of things. Look at verse 17 of chapter 3, 2 Corinthians. Notice what, first of all, Paul said in verse 17. Now the Lord is that Spirit. I can't explain to you God the Son and God the Spirit. I can't explain to you how that the Son is the everlasting Father. Except the triune Godhead, which is one. The Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord, there is liberty or freedom. What does that mean? It doesn't mean freedom to do whatever you want to do. It means freedom to be able to do what God wants you to do. It means freedom from trying to perform for God. It means the freedom to turn loose and let God work through you. Verse 18. But Paul says, but we all, Christians, with an open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed to the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. What is Paul talking about there? Paul says, as we look into God, we look into His Word. And we're going to study more on this in lessons ahead. As we look into God and who He is and what His will is, as we look into this, it's like we're looking into a mirror. And as we look into that mirror, we get a reflection not only of who we are, but also we can get a vision of who God wants us to be. And the Spirit is able to work in our lives and to change us from glory to even to greater glory. You know, as the old saying goes, I'm not who I used to be, but praise God, I'm not who I should be, but praise God, I'm not who I used to be. I'm on this process. I'm on this road. Praise God. The Holy Spirit took me by the hand as a 12-year-old boy. Whew, I've grieved the Holy Spirit in my life at times. But He's faithful. He abides with me forever. He took me by the hand as a 12-year-old boy, and He led me to salvation. Then after leading me to salvation, the Holy Spirit has been leading me along. He led me to who I would pick to choose my wife. He led me to go into the ministry. He led me to Tennessee Temple. He led me to Liberty. He led me to Ohio. He led me to Twin Oaks. He'll lead me home. God leads His dear children along. I'm just following God through this life. What will the Holy Spirit do in our lives? I wrote down a few things. He'll give us the courage to share our faith and invite other people to church. He'll give us the patience and even to be able to love those who oppose us. He'll help us understand the Bible and apply it to our lives. He'll teach us how to pray in such a way that God will move and perform miracles. He'll give us peace when our circumstances aren't peaceful. He'll give us the ability to resist temptation and strengthen our areas of weaknesses. He'll teach us to deny ourselves so that we might serve others. He'll help us be faithful in our marriages. He'll Help us to raise children who know and love the Lord. He'll be, help us to be gentle when otherwise we would be unkind. He'll cause us to be a reflection of our Savior. That's what God wants to do. I want a praise team to come. I'd like to ask you to quietly stand to your feet. We're going to sing a song we sang just a few moments ago. And as we sing this song together, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, I want you to just, if you feel like you need to come and kneel to yield to Him today, I don't care if you're playing the piano, whatever you're doing, <laughs> doing sound, whatever. If He's speaking to your heart today, I want you to yield to Him. Let the Holy Spirit work and move in your life. Let's sing this together. You, you yield to the Spirit as He speaks.